Good morning and God's peace to you. It's great to be here with you. We are continuing in our study of uh, the parables, Jesus' parabolic teaching. And uh, this morning I woke up and I went outside and embraced what I have come to enjoy as a brisk, cold Oregon fall. Um, we, fall is upon us, and I really enjoy this time of year. I enjoy the change of seasons. I grew up in Northern California where there's two seasons, uh, basically is hot and a little less hot. Um, here you kind of have two seasons too, you know, it's cold and wet and then a little less cold and wet. Uh, but we lived in West Virginia for about 10 years, and while we were there, we got to experience all four seasons. We had spring, summer, fall, and winter. And I uh, really came to enjoy the change of seasons. There would be a change, something new. Um, one thing I learned while I was out there, though, is that not all leaves fall in the fall. If you go back east, you can go uh, certainly up into New England, but even in Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, you can take fall foliage tours where you can just drive around and look at all the fall leaf colors uh, changing. There's bright reds and purples and yellows and uh, burnt rust orange and things like that. Here you kind of see that too. It's, it can get real pretty here in the fall as well. And there are some leaves that don't fall in the fall. They fall in the spring. For example, a hickory tree, or uh, if you're in the south, those old southern magnolias that have the large leaves, uh, they will hold on through the winter and then fall in the spring. So you might be walking along in the spring outdoors and have leaves falling on you and thinking, am I in the spring or am I in the fall? What's going on here? Well, certain trees will hold their leaves until the spring. And then they let go of those leaves because new leaves, new buds are coming through and they force out the old leaves. When we look to Jesus' teaching today in Luke chapter 5 as well as Matthew 13, we see that he's dealing with the old and the new and how there's often a change that occurs where the old is set aside and the new has to come in. And that can be experienced by some people as just very unsettling disturbing and confusing. And other folks, they can find it to be refreshing in a time of celebration and joy. Have you ever faced a change that you weren't ready for? You ever find change unsettling? Some people really like it. They like new stuff. They like change. But probably all of us have a limit to how much change we can endure. Well, when Jesus came and he was born of a woman and he walked among us as a man, things were going to change in dramatic ways as never before. So we turn to our text this morning in Luke chapter 5. We're going to spend most of our time in Luke 5, and then we'll note uh, toward the end of our message this morning what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 13. But let's begin in Luke chapter 5, there in verse 33. The Pharisees come to Jesus, and they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours, yours go on eating and drinking. So they see a, a contrast between their disciples as the Pharisees. Um, they were rabbis. They had disciples. And then the contrast is also between John's disciples, John the Baptist and Jesus and his disciples. Jesus' disciples, they go on eating and drinking while the rest of them fast. What is going on here, they ask. And Jesus answers, verse 34, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom has been taken from them. In those days they will fast. Well, let's deal with this fasting business to begin with. Any of you uh, practice fasting recently? Is that something that's a regular part? Maybe it is. Uh, Christians have practiced fasting throughout the centuries. Um, it is a practice and it's encouraged. I wouldn't say you'd find it commanded uh, in the New Testament, as we're going to see. Uh, but it's something that people do all throughout the Bible. And during Jesus' day, it was something practiced as a matter of religious ritual. Fasting being the restriction of food uh, for a time of mourning or a time of uh, religious observance. 
And so what you'd find with fasting is uh, there was one time in all the Old Testament that Moses commands people to fast, and that's on the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16, they have an actual command to fast because it makes sense. They're mourning their sins, so it makes sense to fast. Fasting is often associated with mourning. Sometimes uh, fasting is associated with seeking God trying to find uh, God's help during a difficult time or wanting to spend time just alone with God to escape the difficulties and challenges of the world. We see that as well. We see it in the fasting of the early church when they would send out missionaries. In Acts 13, they would fast in order to seek God's help in that great event. Later on, when those same missionaries would appoint elders in the churches they had planted Uh, In Acts 14, the Bible says that they fasted and prayed as they set those elders over the flocks that they had planted. So there's lots of fasting going on in the New Testament. In fact, even though the law only required one fast day on the Day of the Atonement, the Pharisees, they boasted about how often they fasted. You remember Jesus talked about the self-righteous Pharisee who raised his eyes to heaven and he thanked God that he was not like the sinner, the the tax collector. And one of the reasons he thought he was so much better is he, he said, I fast twice a week. That was evidence that he was better than the other sinners. The Pharisees fasted twice a week and boasted of their fasting because it had become for them essentially a ritual. Now, maybe today you're thinking, I don't know, the pastor's talking about fasting. Uh, Lunch is getting pretty close. This may not be exactly the message I want to hear. And I agree with you. I too can be slow to fast on occasion. And don't get the idea that a lot of people have about fasting, that it's just dieting, right? Or that it's fast food. That'd be the opposite idea. Fasting is is a religious ritual, that was adopted uh, by the Israelites and then even in the early church. But it's not something that's done without cause or without reason. It's done essentially for mourning, for penitence, and for seeking God. And when we do that appropriately, it can be a good thing. Even Jesus uh, acknowledges that you may fast. He, he doesn't command it, but in Matthew chapter 6, he does acknowledge that people do fast. But when you do it, Jesus says, don't make a show of it. In Matthew 6 verse 16, he says, when you fast, not if you fast or uh, you shall fast, but when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. They made a show, people saw the show, and they were satisfied. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will, be, it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus says, yes, there's going to be fasting, but let's not just make it an empty ritual. In fact, that's what so often the Pharisees had turned the religious system of their day uh, into. They turned it into a religious ritual. So you have the one command of Moses, and then they add on that a bunch of other fasts that you have to observe if you're truly going to be righteous. Well, this is not new with the Pharisees. We go back to the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 58, and we find that God had to deal with people making fasting something of an empty ritual, even hundreds of years before Christ. And in Isaiah 58, beginning there in verse 1, says uh, the Lord says, Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? See, the complaint of the Israelites in in Isaiah's day was that they were doing all this religious ritual stuff and it didn't seem to get God's attention. 
Why fast? Why go through all this if it isn't going to get God's attention? And then he goes on. The prophet says, Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Verse 4, Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. I think that's what we call getting hangry today. Right? Right? People fast, they're trying to do something for God, as if he needs them to do something for him. They don't know why they're not getting his attention. Well, part of it's because they're not dealing justly. They go about doing whatever they want, disregard God's will. They mistreat people that work for them. They end up in fights. He goes on, you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Not unlike Jesus, the point isn't that you bow your head and you look like you're troubled and you lie in sackcloth and ashes. The point is that you actually, in your heart, You're drawing closer to God because you're separating yourself from the things of this world. Sometimes people wonder, what's the point of fasting? Well, that's essentially it. And if you think in in Jesus' day, or even in some places in the world today, getting the meal prepared was more than just driving through, or more than putting something in the microwave. Getting the meal prepared would often require hours and hours of preparation. A lot of work was put into harvesting and storing and preparing, hunting, all those things that took a tremendous amount of time. And if you just stopped eating, boy, that gave you a lot of time to then refocus on penitence and mourning or refocus on seeking God and worship. That's not what they were doing in Isaiah's day. They were fasting just as a show, but it didn't change how they treated each other. It didn't change how they sought God. Verse 6, he says instead, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer your cry. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. So they asked Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? John's disciples fast The disciples of the Pharisees fast. Why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus says, you know what? You're right. They don't fast. And there's one simple reason. How can they? Fasting's for mourning. Fasting's for difficult times. Right now, I'm with them. The bridegroom is here with them. Why would they fast while the bridegroom is here? Now, have you ever been to a wedding that seemed more like a funeral? I'm not talking about just shotgun weddings. The weddings are intended to be like a funeral. They're intended to be a celebration, a time of rejoicing, a time of celebrating the couple and their love and their commitment to one another. And here you have this long-anticipated time. The Old Testament over and over says that God is going to come and he's going to call his bride to himself, that he is the bridegroom. And here comes the bridegroom. He's with his disciples. How could they fast? This is not a time for fasting. But then Jesus anticipates, hints, foreshadows. He says there's going to come a day when the bridegroom is taken away. Of course, we know that was when Jesus was betrayed, when he was arrested, when he was crucified. In that day, in those days, Jesus says, my disciples will fast. So today, if you want to know, should you fast or not, well, Do you have a reason to fast? Do you need to mourn over your sins? Maybe you need to pray and fast for a while. Do you need to seek God and his guidance because you're going through a tough time? Then maybe praying and fasting would be a good idea. But when you fast, don't do it as a religious show. Do it just between you and God as a way to come to him, as a way 
to draw closer to him by escaping a little bit of this world. When the bridegroom is taken away, then in those days they will fast. Now, he could have left it there, but as Jesus liked to do, he, he used this as a teaching opportunity. And he offers a couple parables here in Luke. One of the parables has to do with old and new clothes and patching them, and another parable has to do with old wineskins and new wine. Let's go back to our text in Luke chapter 5. We'll pick it up in verse 36. It says, he told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Well, that sounds crazy, right? Why would you do that? Ruin a new garment to fix an old one? No, you wouldn't do that. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not even match the old. Verse 37, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured out, uh, poured into rather, new wineskins. Now, I love old stuff. Don't you love old stuff? Anybody, any antiquers in the room? Oh, I got a few, got a few. Uh, any, anybody like uh, vintage clothing? You go to the vintage clothing shores? No, no takers on the vintage. Oh, I got one. Yeah, surprise, surprise, Emma. Yeah, <laughs> there's two, all right. Um, I like old stuff. I like old books. I like uh, old cars. You go to the car shows, look at the old cars. I also like old guitars. And I'm going to ask Byron to show you this. This is a 1959 Les Paul, uh, Gibson Les Paul, what they call a burst, because when they originally made, they were painted with a nitrocellulose uh, sunburst color. And you can see in this one, it's just kind of faded. They all kind of look orangey yellow, because when they would sit them in the, the storefront windows, the sun would fade the, the, the red out of the burst. It used to have a red around the edges. And uh, this is the kind of guitar that Eric Clapton would have played in around 1960. Made the Les Paul popular. They, they were discontinuing the Les Paul uh, in 1959. It was the last year they were going to be made. They started this new guitar that was totally different. Uh, Les Paul hated it. He told them to take his name off of it. Uh, this was the final Gibson Les Paul, 1959, that they were ever going to make until, of course, Clapton made it famous again. And now they make them for thousands and thousands every year. But you can't find very many of these because they didn't make very many of them. And they're not around very much anymore. But if you want one, it can be yours for just around one hundred and forty dollars to $240,000. That's all it'll take. And you can have a little bit of history. Now, of course, you would never play it, much less touch it. You'd put it in a vacuum-sealed case and hang it somewhere. But that's shows just a little bit how we value old things, right? We love old things, and there's something valuable about that vintage or that old thing. But you know, most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, old stuff gets replaced by new stuff. And sometimes, it really does need to happen. That's what Jesus is dealing with here in this parable. Now remember, the purpose of parabolic teaching, as, as Cody's taught about uh, this previously, it's to reveal the heart of the listener, right? To unfold and display the heart, to see if that person has ears to hear. And if they have ears to hear, then they will be drawn in by the parable to greater understanding. But if they don't have to ears to hear, if they're dull of hearing or closed-minded or hard-hearted, in other words, they won't understand the parable. And more importantly, they'll be turned away by it. They'll just dismiss it as nonsense. And that's what Jesus does here. They ask him a simple question. He gives them the answer. But to help them understand, hey, something new is going on here, guys. This is why you're a little confused by what I'm doing. They've already been frustrated with Jesus because he's eating with sinners and tax collectors. He's hanging out with the wrong sort of people. Why are you doing this? Now his disciples aren't fasting. And they're, they're saying, what is this guy doing? Now, this is early in Jesus' ministry. Uh, rabbis come and go. And they're trying to figure out what this rabbi Jesus is all about. And they just can't get a handle on it. And so this parable is to help them say, hey, this isn't just another rabbi. This is something new and different 
going on. Now, some of the Pharisees, we, we give the Pharisees a hard time because they kind of deserve it. I mean, when you go around encouraging people to say, crucify him, that's not going to go well in history. That's going gonna, that's gonna to be a, a mark. And so we give the Pharisees a, a hard time. Jesus gave the Pharisees a hard time. If you want to read a fire and brimstone sermon, read Matthew 23. That's Jesus preaching, preaching fire and brimstone to the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. But we know that even among the Pharisees, there were some who had ears to hear. So I think that's why Jesus doesn't just give them a flat answer, but he gives a little bit of parabolic teaching as well. We know from John chapter 3 that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And he came to Jesus because he wanted to learn from Jesus. He acknowledged Jesus was a teacher from God. So he was beginning to have some faith in this Jesus, even though he was a Pharisee. Now he came at night, John says. And the reason, I think, is hinted at in John chapter 12, verse 42, when it says, Many of the rulers believed in Jesus, but they didn't make that known because they were afraid of the sect of the Pharisees. And Nicodemus was among those. And so Jesus is teaching not to the whole crowd because he knows most of them are there just as opponents, but because there might be somebody there who would hear, who would have ears to hear. Well, what they didn't understand, of course, is that God was doing something brand new. This was not going to be just a continuation of the old, but something brand new. The old covenant religion and the system of Jewish traditions laid on top of what Moses required. All of that was in the way and had to be cleared out for the new to come along. Now, John the Baptist, he's already working on this, right? He's given this mission as the forerunner of Christ, and he's going to make a way straight for the Lord. And the way he describes doing that is by filling in the valleys and cutting down the high places. He's making a straight way. He's a reformer. That's what John the Baptist is. He's a reformer. He's calling the Jewish people back to their roots. One place, the Bible says that his mission was described as calling the, the hearts of the children back to their fathers. A lot of people try to understand that, interpret that. But at a very basic level, it just means that he's calling for reform. Calling for them to get back in line with what the patriarchal religion, the, the Israelite religion, has been trying to teach them all this time. And, and those people within would be more receptive to hearing Jesus than the people who had gotten off from the, uh, the true Jewish system because either they've wandered off into sin or because they had followed the traditions more than the Word of God. And so Jesus gives these parables. And basically the parables like this, how many times can you patch old clothes? It just doesn't work. It doesn't last forever. Eventually, you got to replace them. And you know you shouldn't put new wine into old wineskins. Because that, you, you put wine into a wineskin and it ferments, right? And the skins stretch with the wine. But then if you pour that out and put new wine in it, that, that leather's already stretched. I remember when I would play Little League Baseball and I'd get my brand new mitt. And I'd go out and try to use it. And it was like stiff and I couldn't catch anything. It just bounced right out. You had to get oil on that thing. You had to put a ball in it, wrap it tight, and hold it over for a couple of days. And then you got it all soft and leathery and stretched out. Then it played good. Well, that's what happened with the wineskins. They'd get stretched out. You put new wine and that fermentation process starts, it's going to burst. So it's not a complicated idea. That's the way the parables are typically. The idea, the, the earthly message, the concept is quick. You get it. It's like, oh yeah, of course, you don't, you don't keep patching old clothes forever. Eventually you got to replace them. Of course you don't put new wine into old wineskins. They could get that, but could they get the spiritual application? That what Jesus was doing, who Jesus is, and how his disciples are responding to him is something totally different. Let's turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Beginning there in verse 1, Scripture says, The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. 
The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. So this isn't just for cleanliness. Uh, it's because they feel like they're, they need to be ceremonially washed. Uh, holding to the tradition of the elders. Verse 4, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So, verse 5, the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with this defiled hands? Again, another question, why are you doing things differently? What is, what is going on? How come you're not following the tradition of the elders? And so, Jesus answers, lost my place there. Uh, he says, uh, he replied, uh, verse 6, uh, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, as he quotes the prophet Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have to let go of the commands of God, and are, uh, you've let go of the commands of God and holding on to human traditions. You see, the Pharisees had added to the word of God all these other rules and traditions and customs. And Jesus is not doing any of that. His disciples are not doing any of that. And it is frustrating to the Pharisees. At the same time, though, Jesus kept the word of God perfectly. The Bible says that Jesus was without sin. That he was tempted like us, but he did not sin like us. And you see Jesus being careful to follow the, the law of Moses. When he would heal people, he would say, you need to go to the temple and get the appropriate blessing. You need to do things according to the law. He even says that you need to listen to the Pharisees when they teach you Moses' law. Because that is God's word. He made a distinction between God's word and human traditions. That's something we need to pay attention to today. When somebody tells you their opinion, even their opinion about God's word... That is not the authority we should seek. We always want to go back to what the scripture says. What does the Bible say? And so Jesus goes on. He says, uh, Mark goes on rather. And he says, he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify, you make of no effect, you make void, as other translations say, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. So Jesus is saying there's something new coming along. It's going to upset your apple cart. It's definitely going to throw these traditions aside. But more than that, it's going to change the way we relate to God, even when it comes to the old covenant. You see, the problem that the Pharisees had is that he was not following their traditions, their man-made rules, their human teachings. But Jesus is saying it's even a bigger change than that that I'm bringing to the world. There is a day coming when the bridegroom will be taken away. That day is going to change everything. When not only will the traditions be replaced, but the old covenant law itself will be fulfilled in Jesus, who provided that one sacrifice for sins forever. The reference to Jesus' death that's hinted at there in Luke 5, verse 35, signals a time for fasting, but also a time for a change from the old to the new. We see this in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 8, there in verses 8 through 12. The Hebrew writer talks about how this change was anticipated in the Old Testament, quoting from the prophet Jeremiah. Scripture says, Hebrews 8, verse 8, But God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful 
to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord. Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So the change is going to be dramatic. And we see this all throughout the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament. When he's teaching the, preaching the Sermon on the Mount, it's recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Luke chapter 8, and other places. Um, he says that the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So he's talking about their self-righteous traditions, but he's also talking about the external kind of relationship of law-keeping as a way to relate to God. Under the law of Moses, the only way you could be just with God is by keeping the law. There was no salvation. There was no atonement because the blood of bulls and goats did not satisfy. That's primarily the theme of the book of Hebrews, that Jesus provides a better way, a better sacrifice, what he calls here a new and living way. And so Jesus says, I'm bringing something totally new that's going to be a religion of the heart. It's not an external ritual, empty ritual exercise, but it's going to be a complete change. He says, you know, you shouldn't murder or you'll be a, a lawbreaker. But I say to you, Jesus says, I say to you, if you hate your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart. If you commit adultery, obviously you're a lawbreaker. But Jesus says, I say to you, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And so the move from righteousness being an external thing to an internal thing, as the, the prophet says, Ezekiel says here, I'm going to write the things of God's law on their minds and I'm going to put it on their hearts. Ezekiel says he'll give them a new heart. And you notice in that, in that passage in Hebrews chapter 8, he says you're not going to have to teach God's people to know the Lord anymore. In this new and living way, this new covenant way we might say, you don't have to teach them to know the Lord anymore. You know why? Because they're all believers. If you grew up under the old covenant system as just part of the, uh, the family of God in Israel, you'd grow up as a, uh, a newborn, an infant, a child. At some point, somebody would have to say, hey, you're... Uh, an Israelite. We worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They'd have to teach you to know the Lord. But in this new covenant system, that's not what it's going to be based on. It's not based on your ancestry or of your family tradition. It's based on faith. And so for our church and a lot of churches who recognize this teaching of the Bible, we practice believer's baptism. Because if you're going to be inaugurated into the covenant family of God, it's not going to be before you have faith. It's going to be after you have faith. Then you're going to be able to know the Lord without anybody having to teach you. It's a change of how we relate to God. Not an external law system, not a system based on ancestry or family history, but a system based on faith. So that when we seek God, when we fast, whatever it is we do, we do it because it's coming from the heart an honest motivation to seek God. Well, the New Testament is called in that same passage in Hebrews, if you just go a couple verses earlier in verse 6, says, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator of superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So it's a more excellent ministry. It's a better covenant. And it's based on better promises. Now let's go over to uh, our passage in Matthew. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is the second passage that he's getting to today. Are we going to be here forever? Is he ever going to be done? Well, yes. Um, I just want to note what, what Jesus says here, and then we're going to apply it to what we've already learned. So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 52, it says, Jesus said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's the key phrase. This is a teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven. So he's still teaching the law of Moses. 
but he's been discipled in the things of the kingdom of heaven. He says, he is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storehouse new treasures as well as old. New treasures as well as old. So today, you go to a faithful Bible-believing Christian church, they're going to preach out of a Bible that has the old covenant and the new covenant. Knowing that we don't relate to God the way people did when they lived under the law of Moses, where they, they simply had to keep the law and hope that there would be deliverance at some point. But no, we know there's deliverance in Christ, and so we relate to God through grace and not law. We relate to God through faith and not ancestry or external uh, observances. And so you can read Paul saying in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, that the things that were written uh, before, the things that were written aforetime, they were written for our learning. So we go back to the Old Testament because we want to learn what the foundation is for all that Jesus did. We can read in 1 Corinthians 10 how the Israelites wandering in the wilderness is an example for us that we can learn from. It admonishes us not to lose our faith like they did, but to stay and to persevere even in hard times. And so we look to the Old Testament to learn and to find examples, but we don't live under the Old Testament. We live under the new covenant the new and living way, as the Hebrew writer would say. It's new life based on Jesus' death. It's new hope based on Jesus' resurrection. It's a new kind of religion. Now, that word religion has really come uh, into uh, kind of taken on some, some bad connotations recently. And there is a sense in which religion is just that external ritualistic thing that the Pharisees had turned Judaism into. That's not necessarily the way to look at it. James says pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their need. There's a sense in which our religion is the way we live our life in view of the truth. And that new religion is based on Jesus Christ, the life he led, the teachings he gave to us. In Matthew chapter 28 Jesus sends out his disciples and he says, I want you to go into all nations and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them all the things that I commanded you. So Jesus' new and living way has some content, has some teaching. And of course, that changes everything. So today, if you, if you feel like your life is an old garment, and you're just going to add Christianity on it like a patch of new cloth, that won't work. If you feel like you've drunk all that old wine and you just want to refill in your old wineskins, that's not going to work. It's going to have to be a completely new life, a completely new way. And so the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You can have a new life because Jesus made it possible. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus who does make everything possible for us today, that we can have newness of life and a new hope we thank you, Father God, that because of Jesus, our sins can be set aside and, and expiated, removed, forgiven, that we no longer live simply under law, but we live under grace. And Father God, we thank you that because of Jesus, we have a whole new way of living a way of relating to you that just isn't religion or external, but comes from the heart. Help us, Father God, to live this way every day for your glory and for your praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.